Um, and so I set something up here that uh, builds on some of the talks that come from, uh, that you've seen earlier. So John Laurie talked on some of these subjects, Deanna Osmond did as well, Andrew Sharpley. Uh, and so let me start with a caveat that this was intended to open the discussion. And I'm a researcher, and so I've become much more empathetic to the folks who are working on the implementation side because I may very much want to see the results of my research transferred. And uh, so we're going to talk today, uh, continue our discussion on the phosphorus index and on site assessment indices. Where are we going? Um, and when we get there in our little communities, we get very excited about a tool that draws on NASA data and that provides real-time recommendations. And we assume that it's going to transfer and be out and be used by somebody. Um, and we almost invariably fail, at least at first. I mean, there's an aspect of having to be patient. So I wanted to go through a bit of what I see as the issues uh, about moving forward with site assessment indices being real about it and not uh, uh, kind of succumbing to our own sales pitch, which is what we do a lot. We sell. Uh, so the phosphorus index at one level, and those of us who have been uh, involved in helping to implement it, helping to develop it, um, you know, can be very critical of it as well. But you have to see it as a success in as much as it's been adopted either in reality or on paper in the almost all of our states. And so there's something to be said for having a planning tool that uh, can be uh, used locally there. Um, and so you have to see value in that. Um, the frustration that comes over and over again is the fact that we have, you know, 49, 47 different phosphorus indices and they're all different and you cross the state line and even in areas where we coordinate things very closely there's still differences so that if you had a field that was in Pennsylvania and a field that's in Maryland and that they're on the same farm, you might get slightly different results and slightly different recommendations. And so doesn't it make sense to have something that is national? And so we've had efforts. When we started with the P-Index implementation of the 590 standard, um, we had efforts to try to create a national phosphorus index and they died on the vine very, very quickly. Um, but there are good reasons to go with that approach, and usually, um, you know, they involve leveraging, you know, federal agencies, resources that we have at a national level that just simply aren't available locally. The consistency thing is what gets everybody, um, and this could be regulatory consistency, it can be bureaucratic consistency, it can just be the recommendations. Um, and then another thing is that if you have a national kind of scale tool, that um, if you're making changes, um, they can be applied uniformly um, rather than in a hodgepodge fashion. And then I put equity here because there's an aspect, uh, if you have different recommendations that are coming out and one farmer on one side of the state line is being told not to apply manure and the other farmer on the other side is being told it's okay to say apply manure in the winter, that's certainly the case for Pennsylvania where we still allow winter spreading. Um, and yet you can't do that in Maryland and, and elsewhere in our region, then um, there's fairness issues that are at play. So uh, trying to have uh, kind of a level playing field for all of our producers. So when you look at the state one, and I, didn't, I deconstructed the map of the United States right there. Um, you know, the arguments for what we have right now are ones of flexibility. Um, and so this flexibility can be in the realm of kind of bureaucracy. It's, it's, it's a set of regulations that you, all the states have their own, you know, regulations that, you know, affect farmers and, uh, you know, associated with water quality or nutrient management. There's bureaucratic flexibility. You know, states have their own paperwork and their own way of doing business. And then there's political flexibility and that you're responding to certain pressures um, that uh, may be greater in uh, one state than they are in another. Uh, so if you have a state level site assessment tool like a P-index, you can adapt quickly to something that's wrong with it. That's compared to something at the national level that's moving very, very slowly. Um, and that you can be sensitive to local issues. Okay. Or you can have a site assessment tool that's something in between. And so we talked about using kind of a regional approach and there's, you can either take advantage of groups that are out there that are regional groups or that allow that. And the conservation innovation grants that you heard about earlier today kind of are doing that. They're looking at 
consistently evaluating and, and helping to promote change in the phosphorus index on a regional basis. Or then we have you know, models where we're, we're trying to go after things that are even finer uh, scale, uh, like a, a physiographic region. Okay, so I wanted to get, and this was supposed to get people going, I, I don't know if I misjudged the audience, maybe it's just for me, uh, to be empathetic to all the resistance to change. Why change the current model and go to something that it's at a national level? And I was just gonna give you an example from Pennsylvania. I had to talk to my colleagues about it because I'm not out in the field doing this. So in Pennsylvania, the model is that the farmer needs to have a nutrient management plan. Usually a private, somebody from the private sector goes out and does the plan on the farm and they turn around in order to get the plan certified, they have to go to the public sector. So the public sector review there. So we have, you know, kind of these different parties that are involved. Um, and before 2006, um, there was no standard format for the Pennsylvania plans. Can't have that. So after 2006, the big jump, you know, high tech, uh, putting standardized formats out there in Word, and you would go out there and you would run the phosphorus index by hand. Um, so the big companies, of course, had their own um, programs and things where they could do that uh, automatically, but the, the kind of the lay of the land was most folks are doing it by, by hand. And as a result, the plans that were coming through um, looked could, uh, you know, quite different, and there was uncertainty about what went into them. And then in 2009, the advance, and this is nominally a tiny advance, this is not talking about going to some very complex watershed model to guide decisions. What the advance was just to automate the P index in the spreadsheet, okay? So we're not talking about rocket science quite yet. Um, and this came out of uh, demand by the nutrient management planning community. Um, and yet in the process, there was tremendous resistance, including by the very folks who are asking for this approach. We, we want a spreadsheet, so you have big firms that have their own software for different things, for delivering nutrient management plans, for handling books. They're doing much more than nutrient management planning, and they're doing a lot of the planning in the field. And all of a sudden now, they wanted this software, but this spreadsheet just is not compatible with their systems. And so an exemption was built in. And so it's the kind of thing that it's good to laugh at, but these are very real. I mean, these are, these are folks that have a business model um, and who have to go out there. And so we're trying to get a little more uniformity and automation in the process, but even there, you've got resistance. And what I've come to, to appreciate is that those are very real reasons uh, and, and factors to be aware of. So um, don't get frustrated when you propose a new tool and um, people aren't willing immediately to, to, to use it and adopt it. So here are the successes that come from just using an Excel-based spreadsheet. Um, clear, there's a consistency thing. You've got much greater consistency. And this was even just within a plan, the nitrogen recommendations versus the phosphorus recommendations. They all were built on the same assumptions and were using uh, the same sources of, uh, of information. And then certainly it helped with the review and the oversight. It's much easier to read a plan uh, when it, they all look the same and you don't have to kind of interpret things and you don't have to question what assumptions went into it. Um, so the other thing behind it is uh, that it's tied to um, the uh, various recommendation sources. So coming out of Penn State, um, you've got the agronomy guide and we've had some changes of late in our nitrogen availability uh, factor associated with um, basically the, the four R's is primarily with the, the method of application. And so if you've got uh, a system that's already automated, then boy, you can change that behind the scenes. Nobody needs to see it. It, it happens immediately, and so that's a great benefit. And there's efficiency kind of successes. But here are the barriers. So this wasn't so much failures, but um, you're just not going to meet all the end user's needs. You decide to go with a uh, a spreadsheet, and I mentioned already the big firms, you know, it wasn't compatible there. Um, you have folks um, who are out there, including our end user, who just, you know, a spreadsheet tool is, you know, is rocket science, you know, they're just not prepared. So there are small, um, some uh, smaller planning firms that really had trouble, the individuals kind of getting up to speed with, with this approach. And so, Basically, 
you've got to be sympathetic to all these factors that may seem, if you're a scientist or somebody who uses these things on a regular basis, like they're, they're not um, a big deal, but they are. Okay, so you're out there and you want to propose a new phosphorus index that's based upon, you know, your concept of what the best phosphorus index is going to look like or the best site assessment index. And really quickly, people get lost in the possibilities. Well, I'm going to throw this on, I'm going to throw that on. And so defining, you know, what your, your outcome is, is, is really important. And these are some of them. Uh, and the folks implementing, as John pointed out earlier, are going to have different priorities than, than people who are working more at a, at a regulatory level. Then there's who are we trying to satisfy as we're moving these tools forward. Um, you know, largely we're satisfying, we've got our own careers and we've got papers that are coming out uh, and new things. Uh, but, you know, we all think that we're making a change out in the landscape and these tools are ultimately going to change behavior you know, at the level of the farmer, of the uh, turf grass manager, even homeowners, any kind of landowner, it could be a forest owner, depending on how far reaching you think your phosphorus index is going to extend. And so for that intended crowd, they, they don't want just generic recommendations. They want things that are going to meet their particular industry needs. But we all, most of these phosphorus indices are coming from a combination of soil scientists and agronomists and some hydrologists. Um, and who are really looking toward uh, kind of production systems that are, if you're from Arkansas, it might be a, uh, some pastures, or if you're you know, from the Midwest, you might be looking at, at row cropping. But um, these tools have to, and, and this is, seems like a no-brainer, but we lose sight of this, they have to meet the needs of the, the industry. Um, it, no one really cares how much phosphorus is running off of their field unless it's going to cause them trouble with their management. That's the reality of, of the, these particular end users. Um, and then there has to be an aspect of not just like you're delivering information and, and dictating what to do, but they actually have to understand um, what the issues are and really feel like this helps them to see more clearly what their options are. And then whatever we recommend has got to be actionable. And so this is where we run into trouble all the time when we start putting the restrictions up. We talked about the, the phosphorus management tool for Maryland. When the, when the kind of blanket advice is you cannot put any more manure on the field, you're going to have uh, some trouble with at least that particular sector. Um, so in actuality, you know, we're a lot of times are, are talking to ourselves. So probably the folks, I could go around and poll everybody in the audience um, right here. Um, but we're actually, you know, kind of lobbying, marketing to different action agencies, could be NRCS, could be, you know, folks out of the conservation di districts, could be the regulators, they want to see certain things. Consultants, I mentioned earlier, the private consultants um, do most of the work in, in Pennsylvania, or the general public. And so the general public example I want to give, it, in Maryland, where a number of us had a lot of input, the phosphorus index was decried by the environmental community a few years ago. So you could go to the uh, Baltimore Sun and you saw that the phosphorus index was just an excuse to continue doing what you were always doing and it was the worst thing and the science behind it was just basically ag science that was going to allow farmers to do whatever they want. So a number of us worked to update that and we changed the name of it from the p-index to the phosphorus management tool so that it would you know not have the the p-index moniker and suddenly in the Washington Post and the Baltimore Sun it's the environmental community who were condemning the P management, uh, the P index, who are behind it because it's a more restrictive tool. And when the Maryland governor decided to, uh, at first, uh, you know, overthrow the, the PMT, um, you had the farmers, a complete 180, uh, you know, flip-flop. The farmers were opposed to the tool because it was more restrictive, and the environmental community was, was for the tool. And so. This is, these are just politics, um, and as you're creating these tools that are doing, you have to recognize that there's, you know, kind of different needs and different agendas, and they may not mesh at all with what you think is just pure, cold-hearted, science-based management. And I think those of us who think that the science leads have all had these kind of wake-up calls like that, that we're just, uh, you know, one factor in there. Okay, so I'm getting to the to the tools themselves, and I'm taking my time. Um, 
So what's the best tool? Uh, something very simple like the P-Index, which isn't really that simple, or something complicated like a watershed uh, model or something in between. So you go from the simple tools to complex tools. A simple one would be the P-Index. Complex would be some of the models we talked about earlier, the integrated farming systems model, SWOT, Apex, Agnips, Chesapeake Bay model. Um, and then you have some that are emerging that are in between. And these are what most people see as being the next generation type of a tool. And those ones uh, are that Apple, the APLE. Um, there, Wisconsin has them. Um, we heard about Tibet you know, earlier. And these tools are really intended to, to take some of the complexity, the processes that you can re represent in a fate and transport model and apply them in a way that it looks more like a, a p-index, more like a, a, and it has a different scale of application, allows you to apply it at the field scale and make advice right there. So by golly, why wouldn't that be great? So, well, part of it is that we start believing that um, their primary job is really to assuage the regulatory community or the public in that we can basically use these to show that a farmer implementing a set of practices by injecting manure in this field, he's going to reduce the watershed phosphorus load by this amount. Um, that that is the end goal. So um, these are things that people want to know, and they're certainly what's driving environmental management. Um, but uh, not all these tools can provide uh, that kind of information. So you can make modifications to your existing index. Here's the simple uh, index as it started out. It basically lumped all of the pathways of phosphorus transport together. Um, and uh, this is the Pennsylvania P-Index. Carl Bolster did this. And we lump erosion processes with, with runoff processes to get it a total uh, vulnerability to phosphorus loss. Um, but what folks are finding is that if they start to uh, parse that out uh, they, and they go into what we call the component uh, p-index where you have one factor for sediment phosphorus, one for soluble phosphorus, one for leaching uh, of phosphorus, that they can do a better job uh, in, at least in terms of predicting water quality. And so I think to some extent this is seen as at least working within the realm of the p-index as basically the next you know, big step. So what's the best use? This is coming straight from Pete Vadas, uh, so that's my caveat here. Um, the best use of the PMX is making you know, management decisions very much oriented towards that. Uh, there's an educational side, um, and that also that we believe it, but we basically believe the direction that it predicts. If you do this, things will get a little better. If you do this, things will get worse, that type of thing. It's not really intended to be a quantitative tool. There's issues with scale that it's applied. There's issues with the formulation of the P-indices. Um, and then uh, also in terms of temporal scale, it's not meant to be applied at that level. So Pete argues that the P-index, and this is what we're trying to do, requires the validation, the verification that complex models have had. And so too many of our P-indices out there have just not had this. This is old news. Um, and so he gives an example of Apple, which is his model, uh, in which you can see the majority of the points uh, on that scatter plot between Apple prediction and measured phosphorus losses uh, fall in a nice uh, kind of a linear uh, relationship. And a lot of them are correct. Whereas if you look at the p-index, um, you see different distributions. You can explain them, uh, but it's just simply not a, a kind of a comprehensive overarching model. So the one thing with the p-index is that it's been designed to allow you to make recommendations at the field level. And if you go fancy, then you have to think about converting your fancy fate and transport output to something that more or less kind of speaks like a p-index. And so here's an example uh, by Tammy Veith and company in which they essentially converted SWOT output, this, this watershed model output, to uh, some ratings. So it doesn't take that much, but there's a lot, I think Deanna talked earlier about what goes in to making those decisions. With the p-index, we're really not rooted in a load estimation. With SWOT, you have some load that's coming off the field. And so at that point, you're going to have a, perhaps some, some different factors. So they've been adapted, and Tibet seems like it's a very good example. This is the user-friendly version of uh, the SWAT model is in the left-hand corner right there. Um, 
and it's one that has some issues with performance. We heard about that earlier uh, from Deanna Osmond, uh, but it certainly represents taking a complex model and a way of kind of making it a field scale tool that hopefully meets some of the educational issues and some of the, uh, the output issues that we want. Um, I think what we've heard from folks earlier today is that running directly with a model like Apex um, is just, uh, it's, it's a far cry from, from where we are right now, that there's so much that's involved in both running the model and also interpreting the model that it just doesn't offer the, the friendliness of a next generation tool, but yet it's being converted and, and being applied. So where are the complex models appropriate and where are they not appropriate? Uh, they're appropriate um, uh, for basically looking at water quality and predicting the water quality, and they help a lot with scaling. Um, the p-index has you know issues there. Um, they uh, have trouble depending on the model with kind of spatially allocating best management practices, um, and uh, they uh, sometimes just uh, selecting single practices. They're they're not really uh, that useful there. So I'll, the last slide I have here before I open up with a couple of questions is that as we move to these other models, and I listed those models earlier, um, they deliver some information, um, but they don't deliver all the information. This is what John Laurie was referring to as implementation. There's now a growing crop of tools that are out there that, that harness weather forecasts. Um, so NOAA has really jumped into this uh, with uh, both feet. Uh, but you have various versions. The private sector is in it too. Climate Corp, I just saw something for making nitrogen-based uh, recommendations that are providing the day-to-day -day operational support that the P-Index is not intended to provide. And as Deanna documented when she looked at conservation practices around the country, results in the P-Index being kind of the Rodney Dangerfield of the conservation world. It definitely gets very, very little uh, appreciation because a lot of what you're doing is paperwork um, and that if you're changing your practices it's very very hard to actually see um, what the outcome is uh, it's either way downstream or it's going to happen at a different time and so these types of tools could be part of a future you know phosphorus index um, it's hard to say 